he was on a glorified he was on the word. We ask today that you rest your, your spirit will rest upon us and always I decree all things that are feet of you today that you will increase because you will are holy, you will are righteous, and you will on our element. You be glory, to you be honor, to you be dominion, to you be might, to you be praise. And we're asking in this moment that you keep us and share with us your truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepted from my sight, Yahweh. You are our redeemer, you are our strength, you are our precious Amen. Amen. All right, everybody, let's get started. Yahweh be praised for his grace and his mercy extended toward us. If you're coming in on Facebook, we do want you to make your business. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we'll have to go back and trim this off of the Facebook. We want to make this your business to uh, uh, make a share today. Um, this is information that will help literally the rest of the world. And uh, not everybody is aware of the information we're going to share with you. Some will contend with it, but at the end of the day, it is for uh, your edification, uh, Elohim's glory. And that's where we are with all things today in him. All right. So that having been said, let's put ourselves in proper order to prepare for this message today. Prayer has been done. I want to take you guys into the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy chapter number 16 is where I want to take you initially so we can start what Yahweh would have for us to know. Um, as we prepare our hearts to go there, um, open up your minds to receive this in a proper and appropriate way. Again, if you're on the Facebook channel, please hit the heart sign, hit the like sign, uh, and uh, let's get going. We got a lot to talk about. Those of you on Clubhouse, you know you may need to tune over to, to Facebook for the, the, um, the teachings on the board because we'll be making notes. If you're keeping notes, uh, this is that time for you to learn them. All right. Our text today will be in Devadim 16, 16. And we're talking about in concept what we know to be as our actual uh, teaching uh, holidays season. Holy days season versus the holiday season. All right. And we want to prepare our hearts to really embrace uh, an understanding here for most people who may not know. Text today says. Three times in a year shall all males appear before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, one, in the Feast of Weeks, two, in the Feast of Tabernacles, three, and they shall not appear before Yahweh your Elohim empty. All right, I want you guys to make it your business. Let's get going and um, share this information today. Um, the Bible goes on to let us know very clearly that Yahweh had always a plan <clears throat> for us to do as is uh, his words would require. And the instructions of Elohim are based on and in his book of commandments. We call this the Torah. And within the Torah, you also have the idea and the understandings uh, that he always had a plan because the kingdom of Elohim, more so than the denominations and doctrines of men making denominations, is his priority. So today I want to put us in a proper order of understanding that you're contending with your message today, holy days versus Yahweh's holidays. Now, our text again is Devarim 16, and we just told you that Yahweh in the book of Devarim, which is highly touted as a clear element of Elohim's instructions for humanity, uh, tells us that three times in a year, all males of Israel who have been delivered out of Egypt and now walking in the wilderness, and once they come into their holy, their promised lands, they will in fact be required uh, to appear before Yahweh, no matter where their heritage and inheritance has led them, they are to come back to the area where Yahweh has put his name. That would be on his tabernacle. Now, before people get confused and begin to convolute this, before there was Jerusalem, there was Hebron. Uh, before there was Hebron, there was wherever the clouds stopped. <laughs> and that's where the tabernacle was set up. So every 
uh, season that Yahweh has set forward, Israel would deem those days holy because Yahweh differentiated between those particular high holy days. They are called Moedim. They are called the feasts and not the festivals, though they've been incorporated as festivals for what we call Jewish or man-made holidays. So Jewish or man-made holidays are not all the holy days. So when you hear the cachet labeled festivals, you have to unpack it rightly because these are holidays to that ethnicity, but they are not all the holy days of Yahweh who is our Elohim. So today we want to bring you up to speed, or I should say a bit more of education regarding that, and then show you how the holidays of, I would say, Christendom, not just Judaism, have been grossly misappropriating uh, what Yahweh wanted us to learn and know, and that were the holy days. So let's get very uh, deeply into this, and I pray that everybody is doing well. So come three times a year. He makes it clear. He wants you to come during what's known as Chachat Matzah. All right. Uh, they know that that's a seven day week of festivities and honoring of Elohim by eating the unleavened bread. Then he said, I want you to come a third, a second time, which would be during the Feast of Weeks, which in its proper Hebrew tongue is known as Shavuot. You and I have mistaken that, or we mislabeled that, or we have labeled that as Pentecost. Uh, I, I wish we could change it. Uh, and then you have the third time he said to gather, and that would be during the Feast of In Gatherings, i.e. the Feast of Booths, i.e. the Feast of Tabernacles. Those are the three times that Yahweh has given us. Now, I want to show this to you by proper order out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. I'm just going to give you two. I can give you many more that prove what Devarim had just stated. So we're going to go to Leviticus chapter number 23, verses one through four. And it makes the statement to say, and Yahweh spake. Well, I'll give you guys a second to get to Leviticus 23, verses one through four. If you are, in fact, on Facebook, you will have these put on the screen and you can readily access them. Verse 23 of, 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 of Virak, Varikra states, uh, And Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahweh, which you all shall proclaim to be holy, convocations. Even these are my feasts. Then he explains how priceless these days are in verse three. He says, six days shall work be done. Y'all know that commandment. But the seventh day is the Shabbat of rest. Y'all know that commandment. But these my feast days are holy convocations. You'll do no work therein. It is a Shabbat of Yahweh in all your dwellings, just like the other seventh days of the week. These special days are my feasts, even the, 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 the Kodesh Mikraz, the holy convocations, which, which, which you people shall proclaim in their season. Now, I want to be clear that we understand that Yahweh made it very explicit. And then he backed it up in Devarim and he backed it up in Numbers. He backed it up in Paul. He backed it up in Yeshua. So <clears throat> we don't have to go back and forth with that. So we know that there were three times that Yahweh wanted humanity to gather before him. And again, they are, pardon me, they are the times that are known as, not on the board today, they are, they are in the times that are known as his holy days. Now, his holy days are, again, coming up uh, every year. They are known as Pesach. They are known as Shavu, 
Shavuot. And they are also known as Sukkah. Now, those are the times that we have on the board. They are three seasons. These three seasons break out into seven appointments. Now, those seven appointments are very specific. One is Pesach. The other is Hag Hat Matzat. The last one is Hag Bikurim. Okay, then you have what we know as Shavu, Shavuot, the actual day. Then you have Yam Teruah. I'll keep these coming to you all the time. Then you have Yam Kippur. Then you have Yom Kippur. And then you have the last one, the Feast of Tabernacles, Hag Sukkah. All right. Those are the seven elements of these three seasons. And then if you take and make the additional understanding for the two days that are a week long, these have two days to it, and this has two days to it. Now, the seven days become nine days, all right? So the seven appointments become nine days, all right? Uh, and, and this is the big thing. So Pesach is one day. Hagbikurim is one day. Shavuot is one day. Terawah is one day, Kippur is one day, and then you have the two days. So one, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Nine days that make up the seven appointed times that come out of the three seasons of Yahweh. So this is how you explain this. Three seasons, as Yahweh has asked in Deuteronomy chapter number 16, three seasons. Then he gives you the seven appointments. And then you have what's left as the nine days that makes those appointments happen. Three seasons, seven appointments, nine days to complete it all. All right. Now that's over a 365 day period and cycle of time. I hope you guys can see that all day on the, on the screen. Are you guys able to see that? All right. All right. Fair enough. You 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 can you can we'll be able to work through that stuff. So the bigger part is that the holy days of Yahweh uh, are not the feast days, festival days, festival days of either Judaism or the highlight days we have within Christendom, and they have to be very well differentiated before we give glory to demigods. And Yahweh is never pleased with that. For thou shalt have no other god before me. He is. El Kanu, right? He is the jealous guy. Don't share his stage uh, with anyone. Now, we have these items that come up. I try to make sure I teach this in the summertime because if I teach it closer to Christmas, people get offended and um, they've already started spending their money and uh, they've always be already begun to set their parties in place. And, and then they think that you're just trying to be topically upsetting. And we're not doing that. We're giving you information before you get started. Now, if you continue and do it, that's on you. You have the information. And I want you to understand that there is a need uh, to, to, know, to know what is pleasing to the Father and how not to allow man's doctrine to make you think these are holy nights, holy days, uh, days that he deems uh, necessary. Now, you doing a holiday, let me put a disclaimer out there. You doing a holiday of man's doctrine, uh, Yahweh doesn't have a problem with. What he does have a problem with is you and I doing a man-made holiday and connecting it to or substituting it for his holy days. Leviticus chapter 23 tells you what they are. 
Deuteronomy 16 shows you what he said to do as a commandment. And if you can read the small writing, as you guys have said, you will see the three seasons of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. You'll also see the actual days, the seven appointments within those three seasons for unto us uh, what I love what Ecclesiastes states, and many people never made the connection, but in the book of Coilette, which is Ecclesiastes uh, chapter uh, number three, you have what is told us. To everything there is a season. Watch. A season. Leviticus 23. Three seasons. Y'all catch this? Three seasons. To everything, Elohim, everything about his kingdom, there is a season. You don't have a season. Only seasons you and I have, if we're going to be kingdom oriented individuals and we're going to be propagating his gospel and looking for his soon return and then having him tell us enter into his rest. They are his seasons that we have to know about to everything that you and I would ever need on this earth. Ecclesiastes, Coilette, chapter three, to everything. There is a season. These are the seasons. That's why he said, let them appear before me in these seasons. Here are my feast seasons. These are my holy days and everything you need is in them. Y'all bring up some people. I feel like I want to hear some amens today. So we're going to be sending you guys some uh, invitations to pop up. Now, I want y'all to get this because this is extremely important. As they send microphones down to you guys, know that it's coming from me directly on a directive that I just rendered. Uh, and we need to be options uh, available, okay? So when you read this, there are, to everything, Ecclesiastes chapter three, and for those of you who may think this is just some, uh, you know, rhetoric, I want you to know that this is literally um, from what he has been trying to tell us, and we just keep making our own references. So to everything, verse one, Ecclesiastes, the book of Coilette three, is there is a season, there's three seasons, y'all, that's it. Now, for you and I in the natural realm, where as it relates to uh, the science of creation, you have four seasons. Uh, you have the winter, spring, the summer, and the fall. Those are for the ecology of the earth. Um, the regulating of uh, the wind and the the bacteria and the potential elements that could harm you, the El Nino effects and the uh, ideal in general called the butterfly effect. So uh, the the ecosystem, the galaxy, the atmosphere has seasons, and you and I are much like the very Earth that the seasons for the atmosphere effect. We as humans, a product of the earth, also have seasons by the creator of the earth, who consequently is the creator of this land. Now, the earth has four seasons. You and I have three. You don't have your own. I've never seen the earth give us a fifth season, never seen the earth give us an eighth season. I've only known the earth to give us winter, spring, summer, and fall. I'm going to, I don't know, maybe assume they were the creator's original engineered design. I'm just putting it out there. I could be wrong. You know, that's all I know. So I want y'all to catch that. Now, for that same thing, you and I are simply a microcosm of both the kingdom of Elohim and the earth we were drawn from. That's why Adam's name was called Adam, because he was snatched and formed and created from the Adoma of the Eretz. The third rock from the sun and all of its element is known as the Eretz, the ruddy dirt that you and I grow carrots and watermelon, and I don't know, Yahweh made man from, is called Adoma, which is why man was called Adam. And thereby the metaphors we use, we're just a chip 
off the old block. Keep that in your mind. So now in the ideal of the holy days, you must understand that when Yahweh gave seasons, Ecclesiastes chapter three, you have verse one to everything for us as humans and those of us who are in this season to everything. There is a season. You have three seasons. Put it back up, please. You have three seasons. Pesach. Shavuot and Sukkah. In those three seasons, to everything there is a season and, 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven. I want to make it clear. The holy days of Yahweh are the everything you need. And in the holy days of Yahweh, there's purposes for everything he's already cataloged. Amen. So you don't have your own season just because you sowed some seed. We have to sow in his seasons and we also reap in his seasons. You can make up your own, but I dare for you to call it a season I think you need to call it a, a session or something because it ain't Yahweh's seasons. To everything, there is a season and then a time in that season. So watch, you have a season called Pesach. You have a season called Shavuot. You, call, you have a season called Sukkah. Now what Yahweh did was he put them in the terms that make it clear for us because he will visit us in those times. So he calls them feasts, not festivals. Though they are festive, they are his feasts. They are not the feasts of Israel. They are the feasts of Yahweh, who is the creator of heaven and earth and all that therein dwells. And then the same Yahweh who chose Israel to demonstrate to the world how to be reconciled back to the Father by having them demonstrate the holy convocations that would invite the world to come to the festival that Yahweh has put on. These are not the feasts of Israel. They are the feasts of Yahweh for the whole world to be reintroduced to him and reconciled unto him. Israel was selected to demonstrate that. Didn't do as well a job as predicted. That's why you got Messiah. He never did away with these. But there is a difference between the holy days and humanity, no matter what ethnicity, and its holidays. So when Yahweh gave us, he said to everything the human person will need on the earth, I gave a season and then I gave a time in those seasons to the purposes that you are going to need. I found that completely amazing. So to everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So you have a season called Pesach, a feast called Pesach. Watch this. You have a season called Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkah. Then in Pesach, there's a time called Pesach, along with a time called Haghat Matzah, along with a time called Hag Bikurim. Then in the season of Shavuot, there is a time called Shavuot. That's why you would see in the book of Acts when it says, when the fullness of time had come. I'll leave y'all to think on that. And then you have the season of Sukkah. There is a time called Yom Teruah. There is a time called Yom Kippur. And then there is a time called Hag Sukkah, which takes on three different dynamics and three different atmospheres. We got to catch that. There is a time, and we're going to speak specifically about that in a few moments. So I wanted to set premise. I wanted to give you foundation for the truths of Elohim, and we're going to keep moving 
from this. All right. So you have the days, you have the seasons, you have the times, and then you have the days of convocation. So in the time of Pesach, it's on April, or I should say, it's in, I'm going to do the Hebrew calendar. The time of Pesach is on uh, Nisan 14. The time of Hag Hat Matzah is on two days, Nisan 15 and Nisan 21. There is then a time called Hag Bikurim, the first fruits, when our Savior is resurrected. Let me reiterate, in Pesach on the 14th, our Savior is killed. In the 15th, he is in the grave. On the 16th, he is resurrected. This is not Easter. Uh, me. Then you have in Shavuot, you have a time that concludes a feast of weeks. Seven Sabbaths complete. Add one day, 50 is where the Greeks translated that to Pentecost because of the denominating figure five. That is not the intention of Shavuot. And then we took Shavuot, called it 50 Pentecost because of the Jubilee year that returns whatever was used as collateral to get the families through if they still had not paid that debt in 50 years, the 50 year jubilee of the Shavuot, there would be a restoration. So in our greedy, selfish, self-centered, totally entitled mindset, we only labeled this one of the attributes it culminates into Therefore, you have Pentecost. And then we misappropriated the actions of the Holy Spirit to say that this is where we get introduced in Christian holiday form to the speaking in tongues. Because it was not speaking in unknown tongues that took place that day. So we have misrepresented the very dynamic and blessing and purpose and season of Shavuot by renaming it because we grown Pentecost because we want to actually go through bankruptcy with no issues. You might not like me for saying that, but that's your history. Now you know the rest of the story. So what you now understand is that Shavuot is a season, everything you need, and then there's a time of Shavuot for a particular purpose that Yahweh put under the heavens you and I operate in. Looking now to the next season of Sukkah, which is our focus today. Our focus today is the season of Sukkah. It is the Father's Feast. So Sukkah has a very significant element for us. Sukkah is the Father's Feast, and Sukkah starts everything, and Sukkah, as you've learned over the last week and a half, ends everything. It is the Feast of the Father. No man knows the day, nor the hour, but the, that when the Son of Man shall come back. And these are the issues that we must understand. Sukkah is the representation of that. So leaving Ecclesiastes chapter three to everything, there's a season and a time for every purpose. Now, the nine days of convocation, you have Sukkah, which is going to be one time, it's one day, which I'm sorry, Sukkah, which is giving you Yom Teruah, which is on Tishri one, that's one day. Then you have Yom Kippur, the most holy day, that's why it's in red, the most holy day of the year, and that day is on Tishri 10. That's one day, and that's when we assemble to the Father. Then you have the time of, of Hagsukah, the actual festive week celebration, which has two days. That day starts, that season, that feast starts on the 
15th of Tishri, and then you convocate, and then the 22nd of Tishri ends the actual season, and you convocate on that day, the beginning and the end, you convocate with the Father. Now, I want you to understand these things clearly. Tishri 1 for Yom Teruah, Tishri 10 for Yom Kippur, Tishri 15, and Tishri 22 for the ending of the actual feast that has three names, tabernacles, booths, and in gatherings, which are significant to the eschatology of Christianity. It's amazing to me how we are so close and yet so far away, and that's the beauty of us being a work in progress. Now, let's talk about the holidays that are upon us right now. I do this in the summertime because I don't like people accusing us when Christmas and Thanksgiving and uh, New Year's comes because they say, well, why would you do it, you know, at Christmas time and tell us that that ain't what God wants? Why don't you tell us sooner? Well, for the last decade, we've been doing that. We tell you sooner. So if you go into it, you you knew what you did when you went in. Please don't sing. Um, you know, please make sure you know what you're singing, what you're saying when the time comes. Now, in the holy days of Yahweh versus the holiday days of man, you have a lot of things. Now, I'm going to touch this and walk off of it before I turn the page over and we go to the book of the New Testament. Now, you have the holidays of man, which are things like Christmas. You have Easter. Uh, these are Christian holidays. You have uh, Thanksgiving. You have uh, these are the major ones I'm going to talk about with you guys. Then in the holidays of Judaism, because, you know, we're Judeo-Christian, right? I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, so in the days of the holidays, just a couple. You have Purim. You have Rosh Hashanah. You have Hanukkah. And since we only have three of the Christian ones, I'm only going to put three of the Juda Judaisms up there because we're Judeo-Christians, right? Now, all of these are deemed to be dynamics, and they do talk about, or at least we've made the narrative about our Savior. We've made the narrative about our God, El Eloye Israel, right? Um, but we want to make sure you understand that there is a difference in the seasons and the times of Yahweh's holy days, as opposed to the man-made holidays. And this is a very basic breakdown. It goes deeper, but this is a Sunday morning service. And I just felt like teaching it and not preaching it. Are y'all okay with that? So now I want to take you guys to the holy day of Sukkah. The holy season. This is that season that we must appear before the Father, right? Now, uh, this is going to get a little bit deeper. So if you're in Clubhouse and you have access to BWJ Ministries, you might want to watch because I'm going to write things up here that you're going to have in your notes. You're going to need to have in your notes, all right? So let's get started here. In Leviticus chapter number 23, it tells us very clearly that Yahweh says, these are my feasts, right? Deuteronomy 16 tells us three times in a year, I want you all to appear before me and don't come before me empty. Now, I need you to remember that the enemy of our faith is just that, the enemy of faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of Elohim, Romans 10, 17. You can go there, check that out. I don't have time to go back over that. So when you realize that the word of God is what he gave to Moshe, Again, an error on our part was calling the word of God the law of Mose or the Mosaic law. That's You should have never did that, just like we should never name Pentecost for Shavuot, right? However, the last of the three seasons, really the first and the last of the three seasons, is uh, Sukkah. And that's what this, this season is. It's the Feast of the Father. We call it Sukkah. All right. You'll find this in Leviticus 23, verse number 23. I don't know if I made that um, clear. So let's go there. Thank you. Leviticus 23, 23 through 25 states, Yahweh said to speak unto Moshe, speak unto the children of Israel, 
tell them in the seventh month, that's Tishri, in the first day of the month, you're going to have a Shabbat, a memorial of the blowing of the trumpets, a holy convocation. You're going to, uh, you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. All right, come off. So in this, understand that he tells you on Tishri 1, this is Tishri 1. This is Tishri 1. This is the commandment according to Leviticus. Then you have Yom Kippur, which is Tishri 10. Then you have Hagat Matzah, which is the 15th and the 22nd. Now, they're small writings because I got to get through this very quick. So that's the commandment from Leviticus 23. This is called the blowing of the trumpets. Now, the trumpet is also known as what we use a shofar, S H O F A R. That is a shofar. They also blew silver trumpets um, in that time. And the blowers of those trumpets were known as cantors. Those cantors blow the trumpet. The reason you blow the shofar, you blow the trumpet, is to herald the coming of a king. Watch. Every feast season, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkah, every high holy day, you blow the trumpet because you're escorting the presence of the king. Where you and I have made our mistake is not understanding that these holy days are when Yahweh says he's coming down into the earth to tabernacle with man. He's coming down in the earth to Shabbat with man. And what we don't realize is that because we don't celebrate these holy days, we literally have missed the presence and the visitation, more importantly, the hour of his visitation for humanity. Don't ever forget Ecclesiastes, Colet chapter three, when it tells you, to everything you have need of, I have a season. And I come down in that season to hang with those who anticipate that season. Leviticus 23 tells you, my seasons you should proclaim as they're approaching. I don't know. I'm proclaiming Sukkot. It's a couple months away, but I'm anticipating with expectation that our Elohim is going to bring me everything I need to go through the next season of my life. And see, we don't really like to talk like that within Christianity or within the realms of so-called human faith because we've not really paid attention to Yahweh's instructions. So let's move closely into something a tad bit deeper. So when Yahweh gave us the holy days, the enemy of our faith, of course, always mimics it, doesn't he? Right. So in this Tishri 1, you have Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. And then you have Leviticus 23 that begins to tell us about the day of Yom Kippur. So in Leviticus 23, verses 26, it says, Yahweh then spoke unto Moshe, saying, also on the 10th day of this month, the 10th day of this month. I want you to catch this. That's the high holy day of Yom Kippur. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. That means I want you to gather unto me. You, you will afflict your soul. You'll offer an offering made by fire. Don't let your people come before me and don't bring my offering. That's what Yahweh said in Deuteronomy 16, 16. Verse 28 says, and you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before Yahweh our Elohim for whatsoever soul that does not do this and shall not be afflicted in that same day. They're going to be cut off from that benefit. All right. Verse number 30 says, whatsoever soul it be that doth any work on that day, that same soul will be destroyed from among the people. Verse 31. Here is that part that gets me all the time. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be a Shabbat of rest. You shall afflict your soul in the ninth day of that month from even unto even. Shall you celebrate? Shall you celebrate? That's the beauty of it. You are to celebrate your time of resting with him. Now, here's the thing. Come off mute, please. Come off mic for me. Here's the thing. 
This is the only day, this day, Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32, this is the only day Yahweh requires you to fast. Amen. That's the only fast day. Amen. So if, if if you're fasting because, you know, God told me to fast, well, good luck with that. I mean, not good luck with that. You know, do what you do, what you feel, you know, do you love what you feel, you know, do what you feel. Uh, but this is the instruction for fasting right here. Now, why is that significant? Uh, because in the book of Isaiah, a prophet of Yahweh's instructions, he shows us even how to fast. And this day specifically, that whole chapter, Isaiah 58, is attributed to. The entire chapter of Isaiah 58 is what the fast is all about. Yes, sir. So when you understand that Yahweh has a particular thing, and then you can go to Yoel chapter number two, verses, well, the whole chapter too, uh, talks about the feasts, how they align, and then he breaks out from chapter from verse chapter two verses fifteen through about twenty three. What in fact you have about this particular feast? Okay, so in Yoel chapter two, where all of us love the fact that Yahweh is going to do away with the canker worm, the palmer worm, right? Hey, glory! That's because of Sukkah. Amen. And you have to honor that. That's a holy day because in that he does away with your debt in that he does away with what's eating your money foolishly and folly and, 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 and uh, because of disobedience. He does away with the palmer, the canker, the caterpillar and the locust. He removes that army who's eating your harvest because of our disobedience when we rend our hearts in the holy day to come before him on the day of Yom Kippur and not our garments. Yoel chapter 15, verse well, chapter 2, verse 15 goes on to read on this wise. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Oh, that's Yom Teruah. Sanctify a fast. Oh, that's Yom Kippur. Assemble the elders, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, all those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride go out of its closet. Oh, that's Yom Kippur. Let the priests and the ministers of Yahweh weep between the porch and the altar. He did not say the people. He said the priest this time. Let them say, spare thy people, Yahweh, and give not your heritage over to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore, should they say among the people, where is their Elohim? Then will Yahweh be jealous for his land, pity his people. Yahweh will answer and say unto his people, I will send you corn, wine, and oil. You shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach to the heathen. Wow. Okay. Thank you. And then you got to understand this. That's Yom Kippur. That's the feast season of Sukkah. When you read beyond verse 19, there are the benefits that will be bestowed upon all of humanity and the world because the human has taken Sukkah and Yom Kippur seriously. Now, let me get back to our topic. I've only got a few more minutes to get us through the holy days versus the holidays and what they mean. So today I'm going to give you some comparisons. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to really dig into them and grind them out for you. Yom Teruah has also, by virtue of a holiday, and I'm going to use brown. I don't know if it'll really distinct, distinguish for you. Uh, actually, I'm going to use green, uh, the green marker, to distinguish between these times you did not know were being mimicked as Christians' ways of honoring God. Let me show you. Yom Teruah is the blowing of the trumpets and the shofar. There is a holiday called Rosh Hashanah in the actual in actual Judaism. Rosh Hashanah is two days long. 
It is also known as the beginning of the year or the head of the civil year to Judaism on the Hebrew calendar. It is not the holy day of Yahweh. It is a holiday of Judaism, which is sharing the holy day of Yom Teruah. So my point for making this crystal clear is that the average Christian who does see learning the calendar of Torah, learning the feast as an important thing, when you just go Googling online, you can get caught up in thinking Yom Teruah is Rosh Hashanah. Because the blowing of the shofar, the feast of trumpets, heralds the civil head of the year. See, there is two new years in the Torah calendar, which is Torah observancy. One is the civil head of year in the seventh month on the first day is the blowing of the trumpet. Now, that does recognize the head of the civil year, but it also recognizes the announcing of the father's feast, who is the head of everything who is through all and in you all. Yes, sir, I mean. That part. Okay. Now, what the Judaism and the ethnicity of the Jewry did, which is perfectly their prerogative, but what they did was they put the blowing of the shofar as the cue to the feast of Yahweh, they honor Yom Teruah, but then they added an additional day. They made Rosh Hashanah set, superimposed it right on top of the one day that you have for Yom Teruah, which is the blowing of the trumpets. And they made a two day celebration of it because they celebrated the new year. So the new year has two day celebration. If you're not careful, you'll think you're celebrating Yom Teruah because you are caught up in learning about Rosh Hashanah, which is a ethnical thing, not a holy day, but it falls on a holy day. That's one holiday versus the actual holy day. I want you to be very conscious of now. With that, we press on. So we get past this part now. We got Yom Teruah. Let me give you another holiday. Yom Kippur mm -hmm, is the most holy day of the year. And we, they didn't play too much with this. They didn't play around too much with this. Uh, because it is so holy, neither Christendom nor Judaism, and I'm not coming for either. I'm just explaining to you what you were not aware of because you were born after all this stuff had became some form of gospel and followed by the masses. You were just born into that and it vortexed you right in. So Yom Kippur, they don't really play with because it is the most holy day of the year, but Christianity, because you won't read the Torah, is missing out on the purest of visitation. And then because we don't understand fasting, we miss the only time, if you tell me God told me to fast, if you tell me God told you to fast on Yom Kippur, I know Elohim told you to fast. All these other fasts you tell me God told you to go on a fast with, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your experience is. I don't. This is the only day Yahweh tells us to fast. I don't care what your experiences are, what your practice has been. Because I practiced it too until I read it all the way through. He told Daniel, he didn't tell Daniel to fast. Daniel went on a Sabbath and ended up fasting for so many days, twice. So you saying I'm going on a Daniel's fast 
at the beginning of the of the Gregorian year, Daniel didn't fast in January. And the other fast that Daniel had where he didn't eat meat wasn't that he didn't eat meat. He didn't eat the king's meat because Daniel was Torah observant. Daniel did not eat the unclean meat the kings of Babylon, Persia, and Medes had no law about. So he asked the eunuch, here is our list of foods. We can't eat the king's meat. It clogs our mind and we can't be the king's advisors and we're all depending on the king to get good advice. Mr. Eunuch, would you please consider 10 days of letting us eat what we eat per our Torah? And the eunuch took the chance. That's what that feast and that fast was, y'all. Y'all took it and made it some whole different thing. I, we do the Daniel fast at the beginning of the year. Daniel fasted not from goat. He didn't fast from uh, ox. He didn't fast from, uh, well, you know, the, the, the clean beast. He fasted from the meats of the kings he had been conquered and now forced to serve. Y'all do too much. And then he didn't do it in January. He did it during one of the feast seasons. Wow, wow, wow. So the next thing you need to, and that's because they were in Babylon. The Babylonians didn't honor their feasts yet. Daniel was taking an option and trying to make sure he kept what he grew up with active even in a land where he had been captive we do way too much trying to be deep so now the second fast that daniel had we talk about this 21 day or whatever two-week fast when he had prayed on the sabbath the seventh day sabbath let me be very clear this yom kippur this Tishri 10, which this year, um, give me the screen, please. Give me the uh, sukkah. I got it. So in sukkah, in the sukkah, we have Tishri 1, then you have Tishri 10, where you see the red on Facebook, that line where you see the red on Facebook, you have Tishri 10. That begins this year, October the 4th of the year of the year that we're in. Uh, and it is the year 783 of the Torah calendar, but it begins on October the 4th at sundown until October the 5th at sundown. That is the day that you and I fast from food. That's the only day Yahweh tells you to fast from food. Now you do what you do so you feel like you're spiritual. But Yahweh don't see it that way. Because we have this thing where we think if we prayed a prayer and the prayer didn't go through, we can go into a fast and Yahweh going to hear us because we fast. I know I, I, I get hate mail behind this every time. I, I just really do. It's okay. Because if you pay attention to what Yeshua told the Pharisees and the Sadducees and his own in Matthew chapter 6, he told you very clearly, very clearly he tells you, don't fast like the Pharisees do. Don't be these hypocrites. Fasting as if their voice can now be heard on high. making people think that they are pious. Matter of fact, when you fast, don't do it their way. Grease your face up. Get some lotion on your skin. 
Keep that water hydrating you up. Don't look like you are in some derelict state of being. Make sure you look fresh like the God you are fasting to is able to secure you even through a time of compliance. When you actually fast because you're only eating the word of Elohim, which Yom Kippur requires of you, you can say like Messiah said, they're like, hey, isn't he fasting? He's not eating. Who gave him meat? He looked at them and says, I have meat you know not of. I don't look like I'm broke down when I'm fasting because Yahweh gives us a time to do that. Now, let me be very clear. That's a time that you fast from food. Water only is what you're going to take. Now, if you are diabetic or you are dealing with some medical experiences and they have you on a medical regimen, uh, then you honor what your physicians have said. But those of you who can and are capable and able, you're going to be on water only for the 24 hours of Tishri 10 until the end. Whether you got children or you got adults. Now, wait a minute. The children can't be fast and they, they need their Oreos. They got to have their Cheetos. You, you, you need prayer. You need prayer. Miss, I don't control. Mr. I don't control my own home. Um, so therefore, uh, right, Rev, prelate, if you can't control your own home when your children be in subjection to the thing you say you live, how can you therefore run the house of Elohim? Miss me with that. Let's move on. So at the end of the day. At the end of the day, your children and your adults and everybody who is not under medical scenario, medical observation, medical need should be in that fast from food that day. Now, here is what I want to be very clear about. I'm going to start another page. There is an element of fasting that we should be doing um, often. Okay. Um, y'all want to know? Y'all want to know what that is? Can I show y'all what that looks like? Yes. Well, here is what that is. Let me let me show you what that looks like. There are, there are two things that happen. Okay. You have Yom Teruah or Yom Kippur. That is a fast that Yahweh has given unto us. And you fast absolutely. You call a solemn assembly. That is a fast of Yahweh, Isaiah chapter 58. Go read everything that you do in Isaiah 58. That's what you do when you fast on Yom Kippur. Okay? Then there is another fast. Y'all know what the fast is that you do, you're supposed to do every week? Now, this is where, again, we have to teach people to understand because we've been taught a certain way, and it's hard to sort of kind of cut away from what we've been taught because it's what we, it's what we cut our teeth on, you know, and it's been working so far, so we Gucci. Don't change it. Let me show you when you fast weekly. You fast on the seventh day. You know what you're doing when you fast on the seventh day? You're eating whatever you want. You're drinking whatever you want. But what you're doing is you're fasting from secularism. You're fasting from the world. You set yourself apart to be alone with the Father. Watch this, Exodus chapter number 16, verses 27 through 31. You can go there. It will tell you that on the seventh day Shabbat, you don't leave your dwelling space. You don't bring the world into your home. You're fasting from the world. We do way too much. We can't fast like the, like the hypocrites do, who think that they shall be heard, one, for their much speakings, and then we who think that, okay, God didn't answer my prayer. Um, these things come forth but by fasting and prayer. Yeshua didn't tell those people while he was casting out a demon to everybody turn down your plate for 72 hours, then come back and bring the boy back, and then we're going to pray again. He didn't do that. He let them know that because we keep Shabbat, these things are revealed because in Shabbat, only the word, not the world, 
is talked about. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, for the word of Elohim dot, 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 is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, means the word of Elohim in you, you practice that regularly. When that word comes out of you, it's a light that shines in darkness and anything that is occupying a person from darkness, you have the light to see and discern what's holding this boy up. These things I see come because we fast and we have been in a fasting mode. I see what you don't see. And that is that there is a deaf and a dumb spirit blocking his deliverance. First thing he prayed for was those two things to come out and the boy was free. Let that sink in. So now those are the times you fast. The seventh day fast, that's every Friday at sundown until Saturday at sundown on your Gregorian calendar week, no matter where you are on this planet, no matter what time zone you're in. It's Friday at sundown until Saturday at sundown. That is the day you fast by drawing away, consecrating yourself unto Yahweh. That's what that means. You're fasting. You're pulling away from the world. You're coming to sit with the Father. In the seventh day Shabbat, you are fasting. You're not doing your own words, speaking your own, getting your own entertainment, speaking your own words. You're speaking his words. And the word of Elohim is sharper and more powerful than any two edged sword piercing asunder of bone from marrow. Uh, I think I'm missing it up, but spirit, soul from spirit and the discerner of the hearts and the intent of every man. So you get discernment when you fast because you are practicing the word which gives you that power to divide foolishness from righteousness. Then you have the most holy day of the year where fasting is taken to a whole nother level where now you actually don't have it. You don't eat anything. He becomes your meat in that day. And the priests go first into the actual space of prayer and they pray, spare your people, Yahweh. They themselves rend their souls, making sure they check themselves that they have not, in fact, put themselves in a position where their lives are contrary to the word we're telling the people to live. It's called introspection. It's called repentance. It's called becoming one with the Father. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the day of at one. Hoping that this is making sense to you all today. Now, we talked about the holiday versus the holy day. So the holy day of Yom Teruah is also mixed up with a holiday of the ethnicity of Judaism, which we are not coming for Judaism. We love Judaism. We are not dealing with any type of a... Uh, conflict of uh, anti-Semitism or any way, any way, shape or form. We're just speaking the history of what's taken place with a book called the Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh, the Brich Hadassa, that we've all used as a governance for multiple faiths, whereby we cry the monotheisms that were generated from the existence of Avraham. So don't think we're being anti-Semitic and trying to cause division. We're trying to get an understanding of how we got where we are and why, if we're reading from the same book, we're living it all three different ways. So look, Rosh Hashanah is a holiday that now drapes over Yom Teruah, though Yom Teruah is honored, it's celebrated, it's done. They go right into Rosh Hashanah. Those of us who do not know Torah observancy, we will think that Rosh Hashanah is the holy day and it's not. Now, the next one was Yom Kippur. I told you they don't really play with that. They don't really mess that up, but we do do a lot of stuff that is unnecessary, and we carry out what only this one day can do in our natural world into a other application in our after-the-season world, and we think we're doing Yahweh some great praise and honor, okay? It's always good to honor the Father, give him what you got, um, and Yahweh winks at our ignorance. Now, let's go deeper. Now, this is the fun part. 
This is the real part where we can see holiday versus holy day probably the best. Now, when you look at this, I want you to catch this because it's sort of kind of significant. When you look at this, when you look at this, Hagsuka is literally has three names. One is called tabernacles, one is called booths, one is called in gathering. Now, I'm going to show you something where our ignorance sort of kind of really comes out, our ignorance within um, certain of our systems of faith, particularly Christendom. This is where we are uh, unknowingly ignorant, because there's a difference in being willfully ignorant and unknowingly ignorant. And the word ignorant, if I can just with a quick example and definition in general, means to be unlearned. We just don't know. Right. So in Haku Sukkah, you have tabernacles, you have booths, you have feasts of ingathering. All right. Tabernacles we misunderstood because we thought it was about the church and it's not. It's about Messiah. It's about Isaiah 9, 6. A child is born. The son of Elohim is given. And the son of Elohim is inside of the child born which directly connects to the Feast of Booths. We thought it was just about the fact that Israel, when they were brought out of Egypt, were 40 years in a wilderness as a nomadic people. And in their nomad state, they did not have brick and mortar dwellings. They had to keep moving. When the cloud moved, they moved. So when Yahweh moved, they moved just like that. Now, here is the catch. The thing that they were moving in to set residents for sleep and take a break and wash clothes and cook and eat were called encampments. So when they got their encampments, there was nothing sturdy, nothing fortified. They did except for the tabernacle, and that was still temporal. But what they would do is they would have tents. They would have palm fronds, palm fronds, uh, which are palm leaves. They would have uh just cloth and, and 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 animal skin that they would throw up on sticks or staves uh, and or brick or maybe a, a, a some whatever kind of a thing that could hold it to give a cover from the sun, which the, the cloud was doing that. But they lived in rickety dwellings, rickety dwellings called <gasps> sukkahs, which you and I have defined in the English as booths. So the booths are what at the 15th of Tishri, um, which this year, the 15th of Tishri falls on October 9. So from October 9 until October 16, if you look at the last two imp, uh, entries on that on that on that diagram, Tishri 15, Tishri 22, uh, the 15th is going to be October 9. And the, the, the 22nd of Tishri is going to be on October 16. All right. Thank you. So when you actually get those two days, you're dealing with the season of, 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 of booths, of tabernacles, of ingathering. Watch. So the booths we associated to the wilderness experience, and they were told to do this. So that even when they came into the land, they would make a rickety dwelling and go out of their stable brick and mortar and get into that little tent to remind them of how Yahweh protected them, even in a rickety dwelling. We didn't go deeper into the kingdom process of this because we stayed physical in our mindset because the booth of the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles is the spiritual version of this Feast of Booths. What do you mean? Again, Isaiah 9, 6. Yahweh, our Adonai, would give, our, Yahweh, our Elohim, would give himself, his word, Adonai, and dwell in the earth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word left his place in glory and came down and dwelt in a rickety vessel called Yeshua. That's your Feast of Tabernacle. Because you and I are the tabernacles come from Elohim. 
So we have not now an high priest who has not been touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but who has been in all points tempted just as we, because now Adonai has been walking around in the earth in the flesh suit that you and I say we contend keeps us from honoring the father. So when we go into this place where we say, father, I need your help. The father is like, I don't, I don't feel what y'all feel. So what y'all dealing with? Oh, wait a minute. Yeshua looking to his right seat. Hey, Yeshua, what they feeling, what they dealing with. And Yeshua can say, well, first off, they got my blood on them. Second off, I do know that pain, it's called anxiety. I do know that pain, it's called depression. I do know that pain, it's called, uh, you know, uh, expectation and, and disappointment. Could you give them more grace? That's what it means when that's what it means when he says we have not an high priest who's not been touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but we also have a high priest who is in heaven making intercession for us. So the Feast of Tabernacles is the spiritual rendition of the Feast of Booths because Adonai left his place in glory, thought it not robbery to come down here in sinful flesh, the very flesh he made, and dwell in that. That's a rickety dwelling. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. No, it didn't have anything to do with the day that the temple replace the tabernacle and though the temple was dedicated to the father in the feast of tabernacles that's not why we do the feast of tabernacles that's right minister walker baruch hashem adonai so here is the catch of this tabernacles is what it is booths is what it is and this is where we got weird because right here when we did this all of these feasts come to this one place. Now, the first thing I want you to mention and understand about the Feast of Tabernacles and Booths is that that is been substituted, the Feast of Tabernacles, and that is where this holiday of man called Christmas comes from. I'm going to just put Xmas so y'all can get it. Because this is where in Matthew and in Luke, where you read the story that the father sent the son and the son was born and the light shone his place and the Magi came and Herod wanted to kill him and all these other things. The shepherds were in the field. He was wrapped in swaddling clothing in a manger. That's what Christmas is. And y'all put that in the holidays, put that the holidays, not the holy days, put that in December. When none of the dynamics could ever match that particular season in that region. And I mean that eco season, winter, December, January, it's cold. Shepherds don't have the flock out unless it's high day with high noon. And I mean high noon sun. And they can get them out the manger while the temperature is high. Because at night when they the shepherds were approached and the sheep were in the field, it would have been too cold. It would not have been appropriate. Nothing would have worked well for them. And the manger was thereby. It would have been filled. That's why the manger was empty, because it happened in the time you and I would call either September or October. There is when the fall, they can still come out and they can go out and do their pasturing. And the time that they were going to Jerusalem when our Savior was born in Bethlehem was during the time of Sukkah and Herod was given charge by Caesar to take a census. So what Rome would do is send their guards out to count people in the provinces that they were in. These are facts you have not read because we don't do church history. We just do preaching. So when Caesar would send his guards out by all of his procreators, they would go into regions that they now have province and count the people because it means something, right? Now, this census was called for Herod and Pontius Pilate were well aware that the Jews, this might be an easier count for us because we can get them to come to the turnstiles at Jerusalem because every year at these three times, they would come back to Jerusalem. So they held up having Rome go out through all the regions that these Jews were in. And since they all would come back to Jerusalem, they could count them easier in, the, in Jerusalem because it was the time of the feasts. That's why Mary and Usef were on a on a in not nine months pregnant. Which one of you women are going to travel nine months pregnant like that on the back of a donkey? Who's going to travel eight months pregnant 
on on a donkey over rocks over 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 long trains you're not doing that there had to be something very very serious for them to be traveling with that oh the 16 deuteronomy 16 bring all your people before me in these seasons and don't come before me empty Three times in a year, I want y'all to come. Thank you. So when they would come those three times, this was one of them, and it was Sukkah. Now, why was the place without a space for them to rent? Because everybody got there. You got a pregnant woman, eight to nine months. She is taking her time. Them bumps hurt. You know, she's letting you know, and I'm sure Joseph was catching it. He might have been. I could be wrong. But I know for a fact that they were coming during this season. I can but imagine the delay and the relaxed mode that they had to be in to get her there. So by the time they got there, they don't do like me. If there's an event and I wanna make sure I get the best room, even on my airliners, I personally make sure that I get pre-boarding because I, I wanna get the best seat. I wanna make sure I can get the best seat. More importantly, I make sure I get a bin over my head so my luggage, my carry-on can go over my head and I can control it. I ain't gotta go 18 rows back to put my luggage up and then come sit down up here and I don't know what's going on with it back there. I want it over my head. So if you go up in there, you got the answer to me. So I can imagine that he couldn't have that luxury of trying to get to Jerusalem, trying to get to Bethlehem, trying to get to his region, quick enough to say, hey, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm here in enough time. I need a room. No, they were out of rooms. He got there too late. It's just that simple. What did that have to do with you flying? I'm just saying I can understand how, in fact, they got there so late. Because when you get there late, the ones who were there early, they bought the rooms up. That's why they ended up in a manger. That's why there was no room in the end. See, we've been quoting this as children since we were children, and we never paid attention to the reason. We just quoted it. There was no room in the inn. There's a reason there was no room in the inn. Those who were in charge of the government took their census, and they knew that all the people would be gathered. They didn't have to waste that kind of expense carrying the soldiers to and from these regions when those regions are going to come to one place it just made sense so now christmas is come from haksuka that's what you have there christmas comes from haksuka and it shouldn't be because now we're saying the reason for this is that messiah was born on the 15th of tishri and he was circumcised on the 22nd of tishri why is that important? Because there's eight days from the time a child is born to the time that child gets circumcised. This is a firm belief. We stick to it and we support it well. So that covers that part. Another, another holiday season. Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake, y'all. I made a terrible mistake. Mm, mm, mm. I'm going to come back. We're going to be a couple minutes, so sit tight. The second one that is a problem in Hag Hatmatsat or Hag Sukkah, Hag Sukkah, the Feast of Sukkah, Tabernacles, Booths, and the next one's called End Gatherings. The End Gathering is when you've honored Shavuot, you've honored Pesach, you've honored Shavuot. Yahweh has blessed you all summer long with good harvest. He's been the Lord of your harvest. And now you're going to have to shut down harvesting and sowing because you're going into the winter months where the ground is going to be cold. It's difficult to plant. Barley can make it, but other, other delicate things that they would use and need and have you cannot. So the ground would be cold and iced over and whatever. Uh, so they would collect all that their harvests were full of, all their grounds. They bring it all in shut it all down and they give thanks for what Yahweh had given them that's called the feast of in gathering also it's another issue because it references the rapture when Yahweh gathers us all together now let me get to this so the in gathering holiday issue y'all know what that is yes sir it's called thanksgiving That's 
It's called Thanksgiving. In gatherings has a holiday substitute called Thanksgiving. And it's in November, not in the days that Yahweh's holy days require for it. We think in Christendom, we do Yahweh a favor by giving him thanks. Even in the times of the pilgrims, there were some intelligent people in there because there was actually some Jews over here during the time of, I don't know, uh, slaughtering the natives of this land as well um, to obtain this land. And they knew enough about giving thanks during the season they did it in, which is why it was so close to the end of the fall. Problem became pilgrims and Christendom and all that that part was and its intellect just made a date. They knew enough that they were in the season to do it. They just didn't do it on that day. I guess maybe fighting who you trying to kick out. I don't know. It's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with that. That's a longer story. But Thanksgiving is the holiday substitute for the holy day of Sukkah. Y'all didn't know that, did you? You're going to learn today. Now, so you got Christmas, which is a substitute as well, and they spread them all out. Don't you think it really interesting how we have um, the most joyous time of the human Christian year is from uh, the holiday season, which starts, I made a terrible mistake. I need y'all to forgive me for this mistake I made. I said they didn't play with Yom Kippur too much. And I don't know why I said that, because here's what they did when they played with Yom Kippur. They gave you hallowed evening. That happens in October. Y'all know that, right? Um, because they gave you hallowed, which initially was a good thing. But when hallowed evening ends, you have a thing called the witching hour. So as long as the light is on and it's a hallowed evening, that's what it was, a hallowed or holy evening. But then after the holy evening, the spirits and imps and witchcraft and sorcery were waiting for those who did not understand. And that's how you ended up into the witching hour and the witching hour and the ghosts and the goblins. And in the hallowed evening, there was a way that they celebrated this by virtue of Christianity, that they would go to your door, knock on your door if you were in a community because they did live communally. And they would say, hey, look, um, do you, people would get together. Do you want a trick? Meaning, Maybe we can build you a silo or maybe we can put your windows in or maybe we can help fix repairs. Your roof is broken or whatever, and we can help you with some type of thing. Or um, we also have made some foods. Do you would you want to treat? Right. So trick would be aid. Treat would be some food. Right. Pies, cupcakes, whatever. Right. Fruit, you know, because back then that's what it was. This is where you get trick or treat from. But the trick or treat would happen during the hallowed evening. Now, watch. This had nothing to do with the 12 o'clock hour on the Gregorian calendar as much as it had to do with the hour that the actual evening would end. Because at sundown, hallowed evening was over. So if you were out finishing your trick or delivering your treat, when the sun went down, it got dark. And now that that day is over, wickedness knew it could begin to rain. This is the concept. Y'all got to understand where Halloween came from. And then it just got worse. We can go deeper. But these are the holidays versus the holy days. So when you dress up, you would dress up in the effort to scare someone. Halloween was not about, Halloween evening was not about you dressing up in these costumes. You came with a trick or a treat for your neighbors and everybody got blessed in that process. That's how it started. 
Now, of course, with the debauchery and the perversion of our minds, we pushed Halloween into the part that wasn't a hallowed evening. And then we went and made it the witching hour. Now you've got that overlaying from the witching hour. Now it runs the hallowed evening. Hallowed meant holy evening meant from evening to evening. So from evening to evening, they would be there to bless, trick, treat neighbors. It was a good gesture. Again, a highlight day. Now it's turned into the complete perversion, the part that came after the holy thing that they would try to do for each other. And now you got these ghosts, demons, goblins, witches, wars, and all this stuff. And you dress it up as people that you are not. You're propagating. When you dress up your children, you're propagating a lie. You're 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 presenting them as something that they're not. You're masking them. Uh, and this is a deep thing. So when you engage in this, you're putting yourselves in this concept that, uh, you know, you can you can you can hide behind your mask. And it's it's the witching hour. Now you got all these perverted things going on and they will be waiting for the witches. I don't have a whole bunch of time to talk about the witchcraft because most Christians get real spooky and then they want to get real deep. Oh, witches and warlocks. I'm not advocating that. I'm telling you the history of how you got holidays that you connect to holy days and you can't do that. So that's where you got Halloween from. It was a substitute for Yom Kippur. Which is where you get this thing called Stay with me. You get this thing called holiday season. Now, another part of Rosh Hashanah is that there's a New Year celebration. So the holiday season, which is the kingdom of kingdom of darkness, way of Substituting for you and I from October, Halloween, to you have Thanksgiving in November, Thanksgiving, then you have Christmas in December. Then you have New Year's, January, December 31. We got so occupied with all of our man-made holidays, we didn't even realize they were substitutions for Yahweh's holy days. We don't do his holy days, but we sure do bring offerings to the demagogue of mammon because you buy more Decorations, I'm sorry, you buy more costumes and candy in Halloween. Basically, you are taking an offering to this demigod. You buy more food from the supermarkets for your Thanksgiving meal. You're carrying an offering again to that demigod. Then in December, Christmas, God knows y'all go overboard with your gifts, whether it's Pollyanna, whether it's just Christmas with your family, and then you lie, and we 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 believe we lie and say that our Savior was born. Then he wasn't. Then you got our dear brothers from uh, Africa with Kwanzaa. They got a great process for that. Then you have the uh, holiday from Judaism, which is called Hanukkah, which really means the miracle of light. So if you stop to think about it. The miracle of light, the word of Elohim, is the life that lights the world. The miracle of the light was when Miriam conceived. The pregnancy began. Nine months later would put you in sukkah. Just putting it out there. So Christmas, you definitely carry an offering to, your, to the demagogue of mammon because you're at these places and you you're like well i can't do the feast and i can't do the offerings because you you got them all over here you're still doing it 
you're giving an offering to a demigod of more than what Yahweh would ever ask you for. Halloween is, if Yahweh wants a lamb, if Yahweh wants a lamb for the holy day of Yom Kippur, your Halloween costumes are going to be in upwards and your candy purchases, even if you go to the dollar store and you look at easy $500 and if you got, that's with one child, or if you decide to get a costume. So you're way over the offering Yahweh would ask if you came to Yom Kippur. Secondly, Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, that part. Thank, thank God for the charities that give out turkeys, right? <laughs> and give out the other uh, food. But if you were to do this on your own without, you're, you're looking at feeding, what, eight people, 10 people per dinner, maybe 20 in some cases, you're talking about a whole banquet spread. You got, you know, you, you got all, that's, that's, that's capital. You're going to be, you're going to, you're going to be several hundred dollars into that. And, and that's, that's me being very, very light. And yet we're giving thanks when it's supposed to be representing and it's imitating the feast of in gatherings where you brought in all the harvest and you gave Yahweh thanks for the harvests he be, he was the Lord over while you could sow and plant. That's why if you honor him in Sukkot at the Thanksgiving of in gathering, he's going to promise you rain when the actual grounds open back up in the spring. So he'll give you rain in that season because you obeyed him when we shut down the actual ability to do your harvesting and your sowing because you complied and gave thanks. He's going to then push rain into your first months. Okay, so that's what Thanksgiving is. Now, Christmas, y'all know you got to proclaim these holidays before they come, right? You're already starting to proclaim Halloween. They're already starting to proclaim and look for Thanksgiving. And once that is over, as soon as Thanksgiving is over, they start proclaiming Christmas. On the 12th day of Christmas, your true love gave to you a partridge in a pear tree. And then you break it down and you just keep proclaiming it until the day of it. So now, twas the night before Christmas went all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. And then you start talking about all the drapings and the trappings and that you have placed and put in this world. Now watch this. Christmas is trying to say that it's the birth of our savior. Definitely is not. And then it's doing something that Yahweh says don't do. Christmas has this thing called a tree. Now in the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter number 10, Verses one through five, it tells you, hear ye the word of Yahweh. Speak unto you, O house of Israel. Uh, Yahweh speaks unto you, O house of Israel. He says, thus says Yahweh, lean or learn not the ways of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Now, pause. Look. When he tells you not to be dismayed by the signs of heaven, meaning um, your, your, your Abiah is at a time when Israel has been, in fact, um, conquered uh, and they are under demagogueries. That they've not been able to find the Torah the way they need to, uh, but they would always be reminded. And the heathen um, didn't understand the signs in the times. What was the signs in the skies? Oh, the moon and the stars. They would align at a certain time because there were seasons that Yahweh had called for feasts. And he says, don't be dismayed at them. The heathen are dismayed because they don't know what I taught y'all. And you guys are in this generation unlearned because of your disobedience of your forefathers. And now the records that I gave you guys have been burned because of those who conquered you. But don't be dismayed. I'm going to break it down for you. See, if you don't know the history of what took place by the time each prophet got there, you got the pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic prophets. And most of us don't even study to understand what took place in those times. Therefore, it affects the culture. And now you have these issues you and I contend with today. But because we were born into them, we never bothered to go and unearth them so we could act sure that we can make sure that in all of our getting, we got proper understanding. So back to Jeremiah chapter number 10, the great pro chapter 10, the great prophet, he says, hear the word of Yahweh, verse two, Yahweh said, learn not the way of the heathens, learn not the way of the heathens, don't be dismayed at them, and don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at the signs of heaven, because these are my seasons. Verse three says, look, the custom of those people, they are vain, 
For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman who has an ax. They deck the tree with silver and gold. They fasten the tree with nails so that the tree does not fall. Verse five, they are upright as a palm tree, but they don't even speak. They must need be carried because they cannot go. Now, don't be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to good, do good. All right, now, let's break that down a little bit. You have this thing called a Christmas tree. Y'all, you know the terms? We go deck the halls with balls of folly. La, 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 la. So now I got my little makeshift Christmas tree over here on the corner. I hope y'all can see it. It looks like a fish gone bad, but it's we're going to call it a Christmas tree. All right. You ain't got to like it. It's my Christmas tree. I did not ask you to judge me. Stop judging me. It is my tree and it's a Christmas tree. I don't care what y'all say. All right. And he says, don't do this. Now, the tree is not evil because they got to carry the tree. You cut down what I made alive and brought it in to make it look artificial in your place and you nail it. It was perfectly fine where I had it growing, but these jokers went and cut it down, brought it into their space and put a hammer to it to keep it from, so it looked like it's out in the natural. That th This is vain. He says, listen, it's not that it's evil because it can't do evil, but it also can't do good. There is no good it can do. There's no evil it can do. So let's keep that clear. So do not do this. Put it back up. Learn not the way of the heathen. The customs of the people are vain. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails. Don't do it. Thank you. So he doesn't want us doing a Christmas tree. And if he don't want us doing that naturally in our homes, understanding Chris Kringle is not Christmas, understanding that Christos Mas, the Latin interpretation and the Greek render for the Mashiach has nothing to do with this season. If anything, Messiah was conceived in Miriam, but then he is born in what? Sukkah. All of these feasts from Sukkah are all of these that have been duplicated and spread out over what we call the holiday season, right after the holy day season starts, before it comes to the next holy day season. So they spread all of these out through the entire winter months with there's no season for. The holiday season is man-made. Yahweh made the three seasons from spring, summer, and fall, and man filled in the winter holiday season. I have a question. No, we can't question today, but thank you very much. Get you, send your questions to the back channel for us. We'll make sure we get them for you. But I need you to understand this, Zion, that the holiday season, all, oh, most of them were just good ways to honor God. The reason that you got a lot of the holiday seasons were because of the fact that we were not reading Torah and they before us were not reading Torah and they came up ways with ways to honor God as it were. But y'all know you got to give God Elohim what he wants. This is not what he wants. So now, here is my reason for bringing this up, too, for those of you who are counselors. The holiday seasons are not the holy days, seasons. You got Halloween. You got Thanksgiving. You got Xmas. And then you got New Year's. Every one of those in type is in Sukkah. And we're not even going to talk about the spring season of Pesach, which they gave Easter, 
which is definitely not of Elohim. So if Yahweh says in Jeremiah 10, do not do as the heathens do. Don't learn their way. Don't cut down that tree. Leave my tree. I, leave the tree I created in Adoma, out in the Adoma. Look at it. Enjoy its beauty. You know, maybe build a house with it, but don't bring it in and deck it and glorify it. It can't do evil. It can't do good. But just don't learn that way. It's 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 vain. It's just vain. Vanity is a problem. It's vain. Don't do it. So then watch this. We because we think we're glorifying the father in Christmas. We go out and get a Christmas tree and then we have the audacity to bring it into our church where we say is a place that we put the name of God on the name of our Elohim on and we put that inside the church with the poinsettias that's a whole nother ball game and then we deck it with silver we deck it with gold we put a star of david on the top of it like we really are honoring the father and then we go through this whole thing of the nativity scene which is inaccurate it's in the fall not in the winter and we give more credence, spend more money, give that offering to mammon in that vein, but never give Yahweh what he wants and think that he's going to come to our makeshift party when we missed his divine designer originals intent and party. I, I, I don't you know, I don't I don't know how better to say that. I don't know how better to say that. But we want him to come to our party. It's my party and I'll cry if I want to. And we have him come to our party, which he's not. He's not. He's 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 that's not going to happen. Um, but he has promised that in the seasons that I have given you. Everything you need is in them. We we've been we even took an order and a command from Elohim to proclaim his days in their seasons, which gives us this level of expectation and earnest desire for him. And we've attached it to all of the other things. We proclaim very seldom within Christendom any of his feasts. Oh, y'all proclaim Pentecost and it's on the wrong day. We proclaim uh, uh, more today um, the spring feast, but we call it Resurrection Sunday. That's wrong because it wasn't a Sunday he resurrected on. And then we 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 proclaim for the longest, you know, Easter in that stead, talking about here comes Peter Cottontail. Here comes Peter. That's a proclamation. Here comes Peter Cottontail hopping down the bunny trail, hippity hoppity, Easter on its way. And we did that, gave it to our children. Then we carried it, sang the songs in church, because I know I did as a child back when. They've changed a lot. So glad that TBN and Paul Crouch, upon conversations that were had with the groups of theologians that we gathered together when they were here, and they have done away with Easter in any way on any of their broadcasts on television. I'm so honored and, and happy and proud and not proud, but very happy for that because that was a vehicle and medium that was carrying this Easter nonsense in place of the God of our salvation. Um, and though they got a lot more to do, but we're no longer hearing Easter, the demigod Ishtar, Astaroth, being propagated in the same house as Yahweh, where he tells us, I'm El Kanu. I'm the jealous God. I'll have no other gods before me. So for us to put Easter in a place where we say we worship the Father, you're putting another God before him. If us to take in this Christmas tree, put it into our place of worship, we're putting another God before him because these were the things that the heathens did. What demagoguery they were worshiping in that place that required this type of a thing is a big issue. Last but not least, New Year's, which again, you know, is in Sukkah, right? The head of the New Year is in Sukkah, right? The new civil year is in Sukkah, and you have a New Year celebration. Now, it's really interesting because these trees become a problem. We sing a song called, you know, the Yule Log, right? Well, if you don't know what the Yule Log is, you think nothing of it. 
Well, the Yule log was a really strong, high intensity burning log. It still today is. Uh, however, the Yule log was something that was also a part of the religious elements that in the faith systems and demagoguery of, let's just say, serving of Astaroth again, uh, more specifically to Muz, where because <laughs> the, the, the concept was that Tammuz was eaten by a wild boar, which is where you get the Easter ham from. Again, a holiday thing. You don't, if, if Yahweh did not give, um, Messiah, Messiah was not, was, <laughs> by the time Messiah died on the cross, the Torah was in place. They did not eat or consume pork. So why would our savior be connected with the Easter ham? It makes no sense. Secondarily, the name Jesus, the name Jesus translated from Yahshua in the Latin, the word Isus means, um, you know, earth pig, fat. Now, there are other definitions and variations of that. And then you have in Latin translated to Greek, Isus is son of Zeus, i.e. son of God. I get the translation mistake. Um, but, you know, we do a lot of things not knowing why it's there and how often wrong it is. So what they, what they would do is um, the Yule log, back to this point, Tamaz was eaten by a boar, uh, a wild boar, which is a pig, which is swine. And then, uh, you know, uh, Astaroth, Easter, Ishtar, would send her minions out to find uh, this boar. And then they killed the boar because it ate Tamaz, a demigod, her son. And I don't know how a god gets eaten by its creation, if it created it. Well, clearly it's self-appointed, right? So a boar ate Tamaz. They ate the boar. That's how you got the, the Easter ham celebration every year. Easter. Got nothing to do with our Savior. Then you have the time when Tamaz was supposed to be in a ruling position, he would require that they would sacrifice unto him their children. They would use the Yule log to sacrifice the children. Wow. To start the new year. Now that's in a lot of different faith systems. You got the Celtics, you got the uh, the Nords, uh, you got all the different places. And they come from other regions, other areas, but they got con they got connected through the pushing and propagating of uh, Rome and uh, of uh, Catholicism uh, in all these different regions. And so you picked up stuff everywhere. That's why Catholicism does this. Catholicism does a very interesting thing, and we're going to end this here. Here is what Christianity, for those of you who don't know, is. I am a classified Christian. Don't get it twisted. I just want you to know the history. So you have all the different faith systems, right? This is Catholicism. You have faith system one, faith system two, faith system three, faith system four, five, six, seven. You got Medes, Parisians. Uh, you got um, faith system eight, faith system nine, uh, and faith system 10, right? All of these are from different areas that they've conquered. They're helping to bring them into the fold. Catholic means multiple faith systems under one. Now, the catch was that would be Catholicism. When someone heard, one of the deep emperors heard, and we're going to be nameless right now, but I can give them to you. Um, when he heard the story of Yeshua HaMashiach, um, and they called him the Christos because Mashiach translated into Greek meant Christos. But Mashiach meant all these different definitions. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, uh, safety, security, tran tranquility, harmony. He meant all that. He's all these different these things. He's the grace of God. Right. But then the word Christos meant the anointed one and his anointing. So those were two definitions that was very shallow but it was what was used because they didn't have a word to really qualify all that mashiach stood for now you and i got this jesus the christ now right yes son of god 
right? Jesus, right? That's what it is. Y'all can get mad at me, but that's what it is. And some will say that's not what happened. Go search it deeper than your little Google search. So when you look at it, you have um, someone heard the story of Messiah. They said, wow, this is the epitome of like a good, righteous soul, right? Oh, and he died for what he believed. They took the story of Messiah. They did not convert to Messiah. But to control the people to promote unity and what religion in their construct should look like, they took the story of Messiah calling him Christ, and they spread that as the canopy over their demagoguery and their other faith systems, and this, beloved, is Catholicism. And they turned it Christianity. This is why you got Easter, Christmas, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Thanksgiving, Yulog, New Year's, because they had to incorporate all these regions who had all these types of worship and they put them under one umbrella. It's like a license. And this is this is the reality of where we have Christianity come from. Today is what we wanted to share with you guys some information so that you guys could see and hear just a little bit about the difference between the holidays. They're different than the holy days. The holy days are what Yahweh requires of us. And those holy days are very important. You got one very serious group of holy days coming up called Sukkah. They will begin um, in the time of Tishri 1 which will be September the 25th at sundown until September 26th. That will be the blowing of the trumpets. Also, AKA people have holidated into Rosh Hashanah. Then you also have on Tishri 10, the most holy day of the year. You don't make any of the feasts. You make that one. All right. That's the day of atonement, i.e. the day of at one minute with the father. That will be on October the 4th. Uh, until October the 5th, from sundown to sundown, you will always understand that Yahweh has a time for them. Uh, then you have Tishri 15, which will be October the 9th, and then that'll be until the 10th, and then the 22nd, which is a convocation, on the 16th of October until the 17th of October. So again, Tishri 1 will be on September the 25th, Tishri 10 will be on October the 4th, Tishri 15 will be on October the 9th, and Tishri 22 will start at sundown on October the 16th. These are the days and the times of the feast season of Sukkot. Once we celebrate these, each of these four days you see posted, there is a service that we will be rendering um, with regards to um, the feast of Yahweh and the honoring and complying with his writ, his word, and his way. Uh, we will be in full garb. Um, about what we are, who we are, um, and what we do. Now, many people will contend with this because a lot of people don't like to hear these things said because we want to defend. I think we have like a uh, element of, you know, um, uh, Stockholm syndrome uh, within our Christendom. And we say we want to be free. The word, the, you know, the word, the truth makes us free, made us free. Well, the truth did make us free. Um, but we keep putting ourselves in bondage. And to be free, remember Ecclesiastes chapter number three, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Yahweh has purposed our salvation in Pesach. He has purposed our liberation in Shavuot. He has purposed our prosperity and our dexterity through the processing of Sukkah. Everything you and I need is in his seasons. And every reason and purpose we have is spelled out in the seven appointed times. 
And Yahweh wants us to honor him on those days. Don't work. Don't do your own thing. Don't go to school. Don't bring in the world. You want to separate and be consecrated unto the Father. This is how you fast and feast in Yahweh's holy days. We do way too much. And then we complain we don't have the capital for the feasts. Well, it's because we were giving them to all the other demigods we did not know. We were low-key serving. It's different when you get all the information. Hope that we've done a job to help you understand some things today. Yahweh, I pray now that I've done the job you've required of me. Uh, it is a ominous job. It is a, a job of great uh, uh, need. I, I, the weight of it is, is one that's strong. The persecution and, and technical prosecution that comes with this uh, is a real issue. I pray you now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart that have been expressed here are one acceptable in your sight and that we have pushed your people to understand your holy days versus the holidays. Our faith system of Christianity has allowed for us to erroneously give you credit and credence within. I pray you now that this wisdom, your word, separates soul from spirit, marrow from bone, and gives a discernment of the intents and the issues of the heart. We love you. We thank you. I pray you that these words saturate whatever is spoken in error by mistake or by uh, just leaving it out by mistake. I ask you to, to bring to bring to bear. And um, we give your name praise in the precious name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And maybe there's someone today that does not know Messiah and the pardon of your sins. Um, Yahweh honors you when you honor him. Man must be born again in order to receive any of the benefits or the grace of Elohim. It can't be osmosisly applied to you. There is a process we all go through. And Yahweh says in Romans 10, 9, 10, 6, rather, he states very clearly that if man would believe that Yahweh raised Yeshua from the dead, that man shall be saved. He would also confess this with his mouth because he believes it in his heart that Yahweh raised Yeshua from the dead. And then he would also confess his sins, lying, stealing, cheating, murmuring, covetousness, whatever it could have been that the word says is transgressive. We now open our hearts to him. So if you don't know Messiah, repeat this prayer. And maybe if you do know Messiah, but haven't really repented, didn't realize you needed to, repeat this prayer with me. Father, we thank you for your son, Adonai in flesh. We call him Yeshua HaMashiach. We ask you today, as we come before you, Yeshua, cleanse us from our sins. We confess all of our sins, lying, stealing, cheating, murmuring, complaining, idolatry, uh, covetousness, and we ask you now to save us, cleanse us, redeem us, hold us, renew us, restore us. But Yeshua, present us before the Father because your blood has now wiped away all of our stains. And Father, we thank you because we know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, no matter where we've been. You will cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness, and we thank you for that. We now turn our lives over to you and submit all that we are to you. Cover us and keep us. In the precious name of Yeshua HaMashiach, you are our Savior, you are our King, you are our God, El Elohe Israel, and we now are heirs of the exact same promise as Abraham. Thank you, Yahweh. Come on, y'all, just give him thanks right there. Say, thank you, Yahweh, I'm saved, hallelujah. Thank you, and now that you are, and, and now that you are saved, remember the best way to make sure that you remain saved is by staying in touch with ministries that are teaching you the word in full, not in part, not impartial. So remember to keep all those things that you have learned. Maybe you don't have a church home. 
maybe you do and you've not learned like this before. Maybe you do and been thinking this got to be more. Maybe you do and just been there because, well, this is where grandma went to church. I don't know. We're not interested in removing you from a place, but we want you to know that if you are having any type of an issue or struggle with where you're fellowshipping and you'd like to know the father, we're not religion. We're not a political group. We are not the new phase and trend. If you're trying to learn how to make it in and have the father say, well done, my good and faithful servant, come on over, let's chat. And if you want to come here and fellowship in this citizenship and this kingdom post, you are more than welcome. There's always order and there's always room. And here we propagate the kingdom and the kingdom is in you. We help to draw it out of you by teaching you the word that's already in you. My name is Apostle V.W. Jones. If you'd like to join up with us at some point, you can just go hit us up in the back channels. Hit us up on the clubhouse. Hit my profile. It'll give you a place to contact us uh, as well as if you'd like to contribute. But more importantly, if you want to know more about what we do, hit us up, Elder Page, and our administrators will get you on books with me directly. You won't be talking to some person put up unless we have to because of time. But You'll usually get me directly and we can talk with all of your questions and you'll hear it from the quote unquote horse's mouth and we will give you the writ to back it up. Hope that we get a chance to talk with you if this is something you've been considering. And for those of you who've just joined in this ministry over the last eight months, we are going to be having a meeting coming up. Elder Page and I are going to be getting back to you guys. So please make sure uh, if you've just joined in and been a part of the citizenship, you let Elder Page know by hitting her up uh, in the back channels and on the emails at uh, the emails you have available to let her know that you, you, you want an RSVP for the meeting. We'll send you the time of that meeting and then we'll look forward to giving you more information on where this ministry is going, its vision, its purpose, and its plan by Yahweh our Elohim. All right, everybody, we're going to let you guys go now. We got one other thing to do. We got to make it our business to get what the commandments of Elohim say done, done. And that is, of course, the tithing and the offering. Oh, my God, the argument and complaining that's going on around tithing and offering. Yahweh put them in place. They are in his Torah. They are in the book of Leviticus, chapters 26 and 27, and then carried out throughout time. Messiah speaks of them. Uh, they are throughout the writ. Tithing is the command of Elohim, and it is not for the church. It's actually for you. Seeding is never for the ground it's going into. Seeding is always for the person sowing. That's deep. But today we collect the tithing and we collect the offerings. For those of you who are still getting some of your offerings from your pledges previously, we want to make sure that you guys keep those things uh, you know, in your heart and make sure you keep your vows. You made them. Now, the tithing is a tenth of your income streams. Yahweh gives you provisions. And then he says, if you honor me first in the streams I give you, I'll make sure that those streams remain opened and voluminous and yet in perpetuity. So those things are necessary. The tithing is a command of Elohim. Let us pray. Remember, you can go to VWJ Ministries. Dot com to get your donations in. Some of you use Cash App. Of course, that's on the screen as well. Others of you use Zen, Venmo and Zelle, and you know those areas. You can go and get your contributions in electronically. And every contribution you give to this 501c3 entity, we give back to you by virtue of the receipts you give when you electronically transfer. So this way, if we don't get a document for you fast enough, you already got it sitting in your emails. Send it right to your tax assessors and they show you how to best apply your nonprofit 501c3 entity donation for either your business or your personal accounts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your will, and your plan. We're asking you now in this moment of time and space that you would grace us with your, your word. I pray you now for all who comply with the tithing and those who comply to give an offering to help push and propagate this type of ministry to the world, uh, setting us up with platforms to get this gospel preached out and talked to. We're asking you right now to bless them back, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we do pray and we do say, Amen.
Inc. All right, again, if you look at the screen, if you're on Facebook, you'll see the Cash App sign and the Cash App thing there. It's floating across the screen. Those of you who go to vwjministries.com, that's the best place to get and make sure you get a secure receipt back in your email as soon as you contribute. And we're hoping that you guys will join us. Get your tithing in. It's, it's a covenant. It's the sign of you having a covenant with the Father. All right. Moderator is going to come and give you the announcements for what else we do here in this wonderful ministry called VWJ and DKM Ministries, Darash Kingdom Ministries. Moderator is going to come now. Thank you. Shalom and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in our Morrow After Sabbath service. You will find us here every Sunday at 10, 15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We want you to know that we have... 21 day challenge we started it about seven days ago today's day seven it's the man in the mirror and the challenge is every morning when you awake to look at yourself in the mirror and ask who will i emulate today and you must answer yourself with either his word or the world you'll be able to find our means on twitter instagram and facebook Throughout the week, you can join us at the preceding word. We're here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Eastern Standard Time. And also, on Wednesday nights, we have our weekly Bible study that starts at 7 p.m. And don't forget that on Thursdays, we have the Bible Book Club. And that meets at 1 p.m. on Clubhouse only, and then 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on both Clubhouse and Facebook. We are Sabbath Keepers in this house and so we're always here under the Rosh Kingdom Ministries Club at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and then again Saturdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do want to make you aware as many have asked about our KYC enrollment is now open and the next Know Your Calling class starts on August 9th. So if you would like to make your calling an election sure please send an email to staff.kyc at gmail.com. There is a tuition for this eight-week class. When you email them, please do not delay as seats will be filling up. They will send you back all the information that you need to get you enrolled into this class. We want you to know that all of our rooms are recorded live on Facebook at BWJ Ministries. Apostle, we're turning this back over to you. And we're grateful for that. Thank you so very much for our moderators and all them who contribute to help this ministry carry the gospel. Uh, we thank you for that and um, to uh, all of those who help us and aid us in carrying this gospel throughout the world and on the different continents of this planet. Uh, we're, we're grateful for your assistance and your help and may Yahweh bless you all who contribute from all the ministers of this ministry to the IT and technical aid for the social medias. Uh, we extend a hearty thank you to all of you who carry the torch of this ministry to the world, even to your friends, to your homes, to your businesses, without being abrasive or Bible thumpers or the like, and just carry this light so that others who see it like a moth will be attracted to it. And then you can answer questions that they may have. And then we, we know that you point them back to where you get your information. So we praise Yahweh for you. And we hope that you will be blessed in all your days. All right, guys, we're going to get out of here. Hope you learned something. If you got questions, don't ask my neighbor. Come to me. Don't be afraid. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, <laughs> but if you got questions, don't ask somebody who didn't give you the information. Come back to the horse that did. And I will promise you, I'm not Mr. Ed, but we do speak and we do not have fear of sharing with you what we have proof in the writ with. All right, we're going to let you guys go. Listen, the Bible says that Yahweh told Moshe, according to Numbers chapter 6, that look, get the high priest Aaron. And I want you and the high priest that when the people obey the words you give them and they desire to hear and learn more, I want you to pray this prayer over them because that's how I'm going to bless them. Aaron, Moshe, and we also believe the new high priest, Yeshua HaMashiach, before he ascended into heaven, according to Acts chapters number one, he prayed this prayer 
over the people. Put your palms out if you want to receive this. Palms out to the ceiling. Hands in front of your chest like you're expecting Yahweh to pour out blessing. You don't have room to receive. Come on, get all you can. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Can all you get. Watch. Here's the prayer. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and grant you all 13 attributes of his shalom. All right, everybody, put your hands back and bring them to your chest and say, I received that. All right, you have a wonderful day. And shalom aleichem. This call and room will be ending in five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope that this message has been a blessing to your very life and your soul, and more importantly, your walk with the King. Well, we have come to the end. I hope that you would consider becoming either a partner with us in ministry, or if you're not already a kingdom citizen, consider becoming one. By doing that, you can sow into this ministry so that we are able to continue to teach this type of ministry at a grand scale. Join us on all of our social media platforms and visit our webpage to make your contributions sure. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Shalom Aleichem.